a meeting to order of the standing committees. Um, unfortunately, we had to do this uh, meeting virtually and do, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, pandemic and, and what's going on a little bit later in my, um, in my president's uh, uh, report. Uh, this is being live streamed for the public, and so I welcome those viewing through that mechanism. Uh, the first meeting of the day is the Budget and Finance Committee meeting, which is chaired by Governor Brian Barnhill. Uh, Governor Barnhill. Thank you, President Wilson. Uh, we'll start this meeting off with the roll call. Thank you, Governor Barnhill. Present. Governor Stancato. Present. Governor Thompson. Here. Governor Gaffney. Present. Governor Kelly. I, I see you, I just didn't hear you. Um, Paul Beavers. Present. Professor Beal. Present. Zachary Thomas. Here. Tony DiMeglio. Present. The quorum is present. Okay, thank you. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes from our October 1st meeting. Support. Support. All right. Uh, all in favor of uh, approving the uh, meeting minutes from our last meeting, please say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the ayes have it. So let's move on to the first item uh, from our CFO, which is the contingency reserve. All right, I'll just pull this up. Uh, Governor Barnhill, give me one second to get going. Uh, did everybody see the screen? Yes. All right. So the contingency reserve report's really easy this month. There have been no proposed, there are no proposed transfers. So it's just an informational report. I don't think we need an action. Generally, we accept the um, report for the minutes. Governor okay. Bernhardt, do you want to? Anything you want to do on that, or we'll just no, mark I, it's accepted? Yeah, I'll just open it up to the committee uh, for any questions. And if there are no questions, we'll just move on to the next item. Okay. Any questions? Okay, um, let's move on then. Let's receive a report on the five year capital outlay plan for Mr. Davenport. So I know this is between Rob and Ashley. They were going to briefly go over the report. So, Rob and Ashley, I'll just go to the last page, which has the, the actual project summary, which is tough to, to read here now. So, uh, so Ashley's going to begin the discussion, then I'll follow on. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And um, just wanted to give an. Is there a feedback? Ashley, could you hold on one second? If everyone could mute their mics if you're not speaking, that would probably cut back on some of the. Okay, is that better? Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, so just a really quick overview as a reminder, I think everyone is everyone here is probably very familiar with this five year capital outlay plan. Just a reminder, it is uh, required of every state uh, college and university uh, by Public Act 431 of 1984 as amended. Uh, we do we are required to submit by November 1st of every year. And then as a reminder, the five-year plan is required yearly. The capital outlay project request is optional. We did not submit a project request this year. There are minimum criteria that um, the state asks us to, to report on, such as mission, inst instructional programming, staffing and enrollment, facility assessment, and the implementation plan, which I think is, is the, the item that is of most interest and in what we are looking at here. Um, the state mandates that we report all projects in excess of $1 million. We actually report projects in excess of $750,000 and up because we, we feel that that's a better representation of the work that we are doing. Um, and the list that you see, although probably not very well because it's rather small, hopefully you all had a chance to look at it before, um, is the, is the uh, representation of that five-year outlook. Uh, for those projects. 
So at that point, I think I will stop and open it up for any questions that folks might have. Okay, are there any uh, questions for uh, colleagues on the committee? Uh, I just want to also make it clear this is this is more of a uh, required exercise for uh, the state. And also this is something that was done pretty much prior to David Masseron really getting fully engaged in his role. Uh, so with that in mind, please ask away. I do have a question um, and it's just about um, the projects that are here in section two that are in active planning and not yet approved. Um, and just wondering um, how those fit in to the, the master plan that we uh, prepared, you know, or that you prepared a year ago, um, and whether that reflects the priority of projects in that master plan that, you know, you that we think should be worked on. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, Governor Thompson, thank you so much. Um, yes, that, that does reflect a number of the projects that we had envisioned in the master planning process. Um, it is not fully comprehensive, I will say. Uh, there are a number of other efforts that we are currently working on um, that we don't have at the level of having um, budget estimated yet uh, for that. Um, and we are working on some pretty extensive um, consolidation planning around looking to uh, consolidate space uh, on the campus that are not necessarily reflected in this plan yet. There's just even in an earlier stage than the projects that are listed here. So it does reflect uh, master plan implementation projects, but not all of them. If that answers your question. It does. And just to follow up to that, um, I know that this, this five-year plan is something that we've seen um, during the time that I've been on the board, but in terms of um, the stakeholders that are involved in, you know, prioritizing this and, and putting things on this, who are they beyond your, you know, your division? Is the faculty involved or other stakeholders involved? Yeah, so I'll chime in here. Um, so the, the items that we see on the list are largely um, items that uh, we see within FPM that require some due diligence. Um, we do a first pass within FPM on that due diligence piece. Uh, and then over time, they land into the CCPC group where um, a scorecard um, was developed and we utilized to um, score each of these projects that would ultimately uh, land into that committee where projects become, you know, um, uh, viable and uh, reviewed with the group to to determine whether or not uh, we would pursue them officially. Uh, once that decision is made, then the project would make its way here to the Board of Governors for approval. So, um, so like a three-step process. First, vetting um, internally with FPM um, the Capital Committee would review, and if necessary, Space Committee reviews as well uh, before coming to the bo uh, Board of Governors. And this, that is the CCPC, the Capital Committee? That's right, yeah. Okay, and are, who's on that? Is it like, is it, you know, um, administration, faculty? Yes, so, um, so uh, uh, Linda is on the meeting as well as uh, stakeholders around campus, uh, Dr. Lanier, um, um, Ned is on the committee as well, okay. and a uh, host of others. Oh, Susan, yeah, Susan Burns. Of course, it's it's um, it's uh, Dave's committee, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so it, that might be news to Dave, perhaps, but yeah, it's Dave's committee, and um, and so it's. It's rather fresh, uh, everybody may know. This is um, probably within the last 12 months that we've been using it, but with all the projects that we've had going on, pandemic and flood related, 
um, there hasn't been a consistent meeting cadence uh, with that capital group. Um, so now that all of that's behind us, we'll see certainly more order to that. And um, I will say that um, uh, Dave Masseron and and uh, and Mark Cornblue, uh, he's also included in that in that committee. Um, you know, they're bringing uh, a lot of structure and order to this process, uh, even in the short time that they've been here. So, so that's good news. So we're seeing change in order coming. Thank you. I ju I just wanted to um, hear the stakeholders and it yeah, sounds like. Yeah, the, the appropriate people are involved. So. Yeah, just in general, um, my expectation is that we'll have a much more robust conversation around this next year, just based upon a lot of the, the elements that uh, Roth just mentioned. I mean, there are some uh, a variety of key strategic considerations. You know, Ashley mentioned uh, some of them uh, are space um, considerations. Um, how the world operates in this post-COVID environment and with my board colleagues, how this is all going to align with the series of strategy discussions that we are having internally as well. Um, and how we even you know, have conversations around prioritizing um, uh, deferred maintenance um, and sort of the, the choices uh, we'll have to make there. I know that's something that Dave's brought up. Uh, so, with that said, I see uh, Professor Beal has her hand up. Yeah, I just do want to point out that while the CPPC should be the venue for at least some consultation uh, that involves the Academic Senate, we have in the past expected to have discussions about prioritization of projects that might come forward, both in the Facility Support Services and Technology Committee of the Academic Senate and in the Policy Committee, as well as the CPPC. And in fact, the Capital Committee did was canceled throughout the last year. There was no meeting whatsoever. And we did not see this list uh, that's in the second set until mainly just a few days before it had to be sent. So did not have any input into it. That said, can hardly disagree with having the major item here be the need for uh, essentially a replacement for Scott Hall. Um, but I, I do hope that Mark and Dave, and I know they both said they intend to ensure that the appropriate consultation takes place in the future because it really did not take place this year. Uh, Governor Barnhill, if I may just real quickly, I, I, it's a priority for both the provost and me and the president to get stakeholder input. Um, Rob has some new numbers that are a little bit hot off the press in terms of deferred maintenance need. We obviously have new facilities needs, so there's going to need to be a robust conversation as a community where we get to alignment on how we prioritize. Um, because obviously there's going to be more need than there be resource, as is the case in, in every institution, uh, just about everywhere uh, in the world. So. I know I'm committed to to make sure that we have uh, robust engagement across across the board. All right, thank you. Uh, and it seems fitting now that we have the uh, conversation shift to the next item, which is the uh, structural stadium repair. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Governor Barnhill. So the uh, structural repair for the stadium. Um, this project um, addresses the aged seating structure at the stadium. Uh, built in 1968, the concrete structure has been repaired periodic periodically over the last 53 years. And after a thorough review by a structural engineer, uh, it has been determined that a complete replacement of the fasteners securing the concrete seating to the steel infrastructure is absolutely necessary. Um, and in fact, a study was done back in 2012 and extensive repairs were made back then. Um, but we've done this again and, um, and it's, it's become clear that we, we need to address the entire uh, stadium structure. With the assistance of the engineer, we considered two options uh, to address the failed fasteners. One, uh, remove every fastener and replace them with new. Uh, this would require lifting the concrete section, each concrete section, and obtain 
access to the fasteners. Um, rigging, staging materials, logistics, et cetera, would be quite involved with this approach. Uh, the second approach would be to replace the concrete stadia seating structure with completely new concrete stadia. Um, and stadia, by the way, is, uh, is the actual name of that concrete structure uh, that, you, that you sit on. Um, this scenario, um, rigging, staging materials, et cetera, logistics are less complex and this option and timing um, would would be much more favorable. Um, so uh, we believe that the second option would in fact prove to be the better option, primarily due to cost, timing, and the extended life of the new concrete stadia structure. Um, cost to repair would be 2.7 million. Um, so that would be replacing fasteners, et cetera. The cost to replace the entire uh, seating structures uh, is $3 million. So there's about a $300,000 delta there. Uh, repairing would require about six months or more of on-site work, uh, whereas replacement would take only six to eight weeks to complete. Um, repairing the, and the, the fasteners would leave the original concrete stadia in place and likely would require continued repairs uh, beginning within five years, whereas replacement of the entire structure would ensure a safe seating structure for 30 years or more. Um, so in review, we're requesting $3 million, $3 million of deferred maintenance funds to address this critical need at the stadium. I'll pause now for any questions. Any questions? I have a question. Um, once these funds are used in the deferred maintenance account, what would be the balance? So uh, we've got $5 million earmarked for 22 as a regular cadence of, uh, you know, year over year uh, capital funding. But then we also have uh, $20 million earmarked in deferred maintenance from the 2020 bond issuance. So this will not impact our our uh, deferred maintenance program, um, albeit it would be nice to have more than 20 million, of course. Uh, but yeah, so so this does not put us in any kind of a um, you know distressed position. Yeah, I just want to echo one thing Rob said: is we're over the next five years, we're going to need to really focus on resource for deferred maintenance. Everybody who's on campus knows there's a need for investment there, and, and that's gonna be part of our long-term planning. Yeah, and, and just to add a little bit more color to that, um, you know, when you look at the capital outlay report, the, the middle of the page points to about 52 million in deferred maintenance needs. Um, that's not everything. Um, we've got a separate plan that's trending in the 85 to $90 million range. So, um, and there's, there's order around that piece. So today's, a point we've got uh, a more clear picture on what that uh, deferred maintenance piece looks like and building strategies around how to attack it okay uh, so colleagues um, I need us to take action on the previous item uh, in addition to this item so what I'd like to do now is entertain a motion to approve the five-year capital outlay plan Move. Support. I'm, so, I, I'm sorry, could the maker of the motion identify? Yes, so said. move, Zach Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Okay. And you have the, the second. Right? I do. Okay. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Okay, the ayes have it. Is there any more discussion on the uh, request for? Uh, design and construction authorization for stadium repairs. Okay, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the uh, request of $3 million for design and construction uh, for the stadium structural repairs. Support. Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, our next item 
is uh, an informational report on major capital projects. Thank you, Governor Barnhill, once again. So um, I'd like to highlight two projects, uh, Hillbury Theater and State Hall. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to quickly cover uh, the aftermath of the flood that occurred over the summer. Our focus right now is restoring cooling uh, to the art complex, which includes community arts, music, uh, and McGregor. Um, we've got two 325-ton chillers in the sub-basement over at Community Arts that need to be replaced. And um, just by way of reference, these two units are the size of two SUVs literally parked next to each other, <laughs> and they're located in the sub-basement. So, so we've got a lot of work, you know, changing these units out. But I will tell you that uh, we are likely looking at um, temporary cooling for the summer and the better part of next year uh, for that complex. So uh, we're working with um, our insurance carrier, FM Global, uh, engineers, equipment suppliers, and contractors to develop a plan. Uh, but it's looking like the temporary chillers could likely sit in the grassy area uh, along the glass corridor that connects uh, community arts and music. So um, more information on that as that develops, but um, that is a long carryover item from the flood that we're continuing to work on. Regarding Hillbury, um, the project is about 46% complete at this point. And if you've been down there recently, it's really taking shape. Uh, the roof is ready for the harsh weather. Electrical feeders are will be set on uh, the 6th of this month. Uh, vapor mitigation will be done by the 14th of the month. Um, installation of mechanical systems have begun and the project is on budget. Um, once Hillbury is done, we'll then begin work on the Filet Jazz Center. Um, so lead time for construction materials, um, as everybody knows, are, are extended due to supply chain issues. Uh, pricing for construction materials and equipment is changing uh, at least monthly. We're hearing this from all of our contractors these days. In fact, some contractors are, are having difficulty holding pricing for more than 30 days. Uh, labor is also becoming an issue. And so what's happening there is um, accelerating projects um, is becoming very, very difficult. So, so we're monitoring you know, these challenges closely for all projects and particularly for Valade. Um, and we're, we're really pushing for, um, you know, a tightness in the schedule. Um, but should something change, we'll, we'll let you know. But do know that market conditions are really challenging right now. Um, as for State Hall, uh, you may recall there are four phases in every construction project. Uh, schematic design, design development, construction documents, and then, of course, construction. So we've completed the schematic design phase, the first phase of the project, and um, we're into design development. The construction manager is preparing information for estimating. Um, in order to um, streamline the process, uh, that design process, and assist with current construction market instability, uh, design assist partners in the roofing, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical and glass areas um, will be competitively se selected uh, to partner in the process. And the idea there is to firm up pricing and hold that pricing so that in the as the project goes on, we don't we don't slip and go over budget. Um, we're planning to release work packets on these trades uh, due to the long lead times for construction materials. So we want to lock those prices down quickly. Uh, demolition and abatement will also be ahead of schedule. So we're going to start demo and abatement in May of 22. Um, we expect construction documents to be completed uh, with, by the April time frame and then get that guarantee maximum pricing for all, all disciplines nailed down by June. So, and of course, the construction project is, is expected to be completed by July of 2023. Um, so just a footnote, we will be back with you, um, the Board of Governors, for approval next March for the early work packages. That would be the large equipment and long lead time materials. And then, of course, uh, back in June for the balance of the construction funding. So um, any questions 
regarding those two projects or anything else on the list? You know, just in general, um, as you were talking, and this kind of relates to the previous uh, topic, um, I'd be interested in learning more about the costs and benefits associated with us going out uh, to the bond market and um, getting uh, funding to cover the totality of our deferred maintenance uh, expenses versus what our cost might be if we were to continue to defer. Uh, and that, that would be some useful information to really support this committee and uh, some of this the near term decision making. So, so Brian, uh, or Governor Barnhill, if I can, I, I, I would say that uh, we can we can provide an update on capacity uh, that the, the university has to borrow at its current rating. Um, there are a lot of different options we have and a lot of different levers to pull. So we owe you an update uh, on that capacity and can provide some um, updates in terms of the ability to borrow the cost, the annual cost of borrowing. Um, and I, I think we probably could do a comparative analysis to uh, that Rob could do to if we deferred deferred maintenance longer, what the escalating cost of that could be. So that's an analysis we could bring you at a future meeting date. Okay, thank you. I'd be interested in hearing a, a brief update, if, if we could have it, of the state of the repair work uh, uh, rising from the flood. Oh, very good question, um, uh, Governor Kelly. So we, uh, with the exception of the chiller plant at Community Arts, we're done. Um, we had some carryover issues with uh, the concrete floor over at Physics and the concrete floor over at iBio, both of which um, experienced such high hydrostatic pressure that they buckled and broke. Um, but right, so our, our work is done. And interesting fact, I mean, we covered a lot of deferred maintenance in the $15 million that was spent to restore our facilities. And so that's gone a long way, in fact, within the community arts complex itself. Uh, to address a lot of those deficiencies that otherwise would have been covered or had to have been covered with um, deferred maintenance funding. So so um, it's a it's a good story. Um, again, the the main carryover issue that we have would be temporary cooling for the arts complex. So that's good news uh, that we hadn't heard before. that's that's great. When will uh, McGregor be back online? Uh, once we have, so we've got heat over there now, uh, Governor Gaffney. Um, so in effect, during the winter, we could utilize the facility. Um, but we don't have uh, sustainable cooling set up just yet. And that would, this temporary cooling that I'm speaking of uh, would address cooling over at McGregor Hall as well. So, um, so our quest is to get that set up and ready for the spring so that we could use McGregor once again. But right now we could use it over the winter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Professor Beal. You're muted, Linda. Perennial, you're muted. Um, I have a question whether the um, increased labor and materials costs will add substantially to the gateway project costs or whether we have any kind of estimate of what that might be so the first phase of gateway that would be the the new hillberry building is unaffected by yeah. these timing concerns and the um and the equipment materials process but the valade um, remodeling, if you will, refurbishment, that could be, uh, I should say likely will be, but right now, Professor Veal, we just don't know precisely what that looks like, um, although we're, we're working closely with the contractor on it. The main issue that we have right now is, as I mentioned, uh, contractors are really having difficulty holding pricing for more than 30 days, and because we're many months away from beginning um, the valet piece, um, it's, it's difficult to know precisely where that would land. 
Uh, we can do some analysis certainly and see, you know, hypothetically what would happen today uh, if we were to begin today. Uh, so we can we can put pen to paper on that on that idea. Yeah, it just seems that it would be worthwhile to have some idea of the range we might be expecting. Yeah, that's a great point. So we can endeavor to do that and share that analysis with the board. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so colleagues, we're now one minute over. Uh, so let's just move on to the purchasing exceptions. Are, are there any questions? On that? Okay, well, thank you very much and uh, you should be all set for the academic affairs committee. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, we'll have a couple of uh, new people join us, uh, but that should just take a second since this is all virtual. So the next meeting is uh, the meeting of the academic affairs committee, which is chaired by Governor Mark Gaffney. Governor Gaffney. Good morning, everyone. I'll start slowly to make sure the uh, members of this committee have, have joined us. We'll hear from uh, Provost Cornblue, Dean Cummings, and the university's art curator this morning. Let's begin, please, with the roll call. Thank you. Governor Gaffney? Here. Here. Governor Brasuido? Here. Governor Kumar? Might be on mute. Um, Governor Kumar, I'll, I'll mark you as here. Governor Stancato? Present. Anil Kumar, present. Thank you. Governor Kelly? Here. Professor Roth? Here. Professor Lewis? Manat Betty? Here. And Ibrahim Ahmad. Present. A quorum is present. OK, thank you very much. First item of business is the approval of the minutes from October 1, 2021. Uh, they're in your packet, of course. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? I'll move acceptance. Thank you. Second. Report. Who Second. was the supporter, Anil, please? Governor Kumar. Thank you. Provost Cornblue, will you introduce Dean Brian Cummings or shall I introduce Dean Brian Cummings? I, I would like to. Thank you very much. I uh, will then we just take it away. In. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Governor Gaffney, could we just take the vote on the minutes we had? Oh, done? I suppose we'd better do that. <laughs> on the question of approving the minutes, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. You, thank you very your, much. Your, your, Continued acquiescence leads me to uh, <laughs> forget to do that. OK, thank you. Uh, Provost Cornblue. Thank you, Governor Gaffney. So uh, as the board knows, Brian joined us in August as dean of the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Uh, Brian is a returning warrior. He earned his PhD in pharmacology from Wayne State's College of Medicine. Um, and he came back to us from the University of Georgia where he was department head of pharmaceutical and biomedical sciences. Um, he is an active researcher in both bench and clinical grant funded research on prostate cancer. Um, and in the short time we've been working together, I am deeply impressed by Brian's leadership and his passion. I'm really eager for all of you to get to know him better. I asked him to give you, us an overview of the college today as both the breadth and the quality of the Applebaum College is truly impressive. So, Brian. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Provost Cornblue. Thank you, President Wilson. And thank you, the board, for having me here. I'm going to share my screen so I can go over my presentation. Please let me know if you are not seeing it. Should be preparing my slides. working out some details. So, are you seeing my presentation? Um, Excellent. It looks like it's thinking. Yeah. Good. There you go. Everybody good? Yep. 
Thank you for allowing me to talk about the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Some nice pictures there. Hopefully you're seeing them all. They may be a bit distorted, but I always love a chance to brag on my college, my faculty, and especially our students. Now, where did we come from? We are actually one of the founding colleges of Wayne State University, established more than 100 years ago. Our name change came about 20 years ago, and I invite you to come visit us and to come see our buildings. We have two buildings, both the Eugene Applebaum College as well as Mort Sy. If you come into the Eugene Applebaum, you'll see some beautiful artwork donated by the Applebaum family, and you'll also see a wonderful museum that takes you back over 100 years of pharmacy. It's sometimes I feel like I am in a museum and it's fantastic. Who are we? We are a very diverse group, 11 different programs with nine, 10 or nine nationally accredited programs. We're always going over accreditation, so it's always interesting. We have almost a thousand students and we are holding strong. Our student numbers have not dropped. They have been maintained. And I hope with a couple initiatives, we can get them to go up. We have over 100 faculty, 20 staff, over $6 million in grant funding from various different sources. Now, if you look on the right, you can see that there is actually um, our programs. And I have a little slide to help us go over those in a little bit more detail. And that slide is not loading. Of course, technical fun in detail, um, but I'm going to go ahead and for some reason that slide was taken out from my talk, but I'm just going to go back to this slide. It was a wonderful program, but we have three different undergraduate programs in mortuary sciences, clinical lab sciences, and so on. So we have an undergraduate population. We also have a certificate program in forensic science. We also have master's programs in occupational therapy and physical therapy. We also have doctorate programs in nurse anesthesiology, as well as pharmacy, as well as a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences. Our pharmacy programs ranked in the top 32% of the nation. Our, our pathology assistant program is one of only 12, only 12 pathology assistant programs in the nation. Our Mort Sci program is the only program in the state. So every single mortuary scientist in the state of Michigan has been trained right here at Wayne State University. Our nurse anesthesiology program is in the top 20% of the nation. Whom do we serve? And again, the pictures aren't loading, but if you have your packet, you can play along at home. We serve Metro Detroit. We have over 500 students placed in practice sites right here in Metro Detroit right now, including and several faculty, including that at Henry Ford, the DMC, the Rehabilitation Institute of Michigan, as well as many community pharmacies. Chances are, if you've walked into a pharmacy in Metro Detroit, one of our students are serving you. What do we do? Well, we do a lot more than just train students in the classroom. We create experiences and we serve the community. Our programs, our student programs are nationally recognized, including our Community Homeless Interprofessional Program, which is nationally recognized and received a honorable mention, one of only four programs to do that in the nation. Justine Gortney, who leads that program is pictured there, but this is truly student run. I'm really proud, proud of our super all year or say Detroit Physical Therapy Clinic. This is in Highland Park and this is a walk in clinic for people can come in and get free of charge physical therapy. Our students are leading this supervised, of course, and serving our. Constituents here in Detroit, we also have diabetes and wellness as well. I encourage you to I'd be happy to take you on a visit to any of these clinics. I could go on. But I also want to talk about some other individuals. I want to talk about our alumni. First and foremost is one of our namesakes, Eugene Applebaum. Eugene Applebaum was the founder and CEO of Arbor Drugs. And he led this to be one of the most successful companies in the United States at one point over a billion sales and had a 45% market share. Alumni. Now he sold to CVS 
1998, but he didn't, he kept on serving Detroit. If you take a look, this is actually Eugene Applebaum, if you can take a look, and his family. His wife and Eugene have passed on, his wife just left this year, but his daughters, Pamela and Lisa, carry on this legacy, and I have met with Pamela several times. Eugene served as the first chair of the Wayne State Foundation, and they have a saying there, and I love it, and it's Detroit first and foremost, and that is the view that we have here in the college. There's some other programs here that I would encourage to talk about, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip over these, but I'm happy to talk about the community engagement that we're doing. Now, Eugene Applebaum is one of our um, more established and famous alumni, but we're still doing a great job. This just came out on November 1st, where we had the 40 under 40 in Detroit, and one of our alumni, Rox Gadia, who is head of pharmacy services for Henry Ford, was one of those. So very proud of Rox and the work that he is doing. We also have some outstanding faculty, including Nora Fritz. She has so many degrees that I can't go over those right now, but basically she is interested in using movement to help us recover from brain and other types of injuries. She just got a $3 million grant from the National Institutes of Health to study movement and recovery. And what she's doing is she's using the movement tracking on your cell phone. We all have our cell phones. And this tells us how much we move, but she's aligning that movement in these patients to cognitive ability and demonstrating that certain types of movement and exercise helps us recover from things like stroke and multiple sclerosis and Huntington's. And not only that, she's an award-winning teacher. We really push, and I'm proud to have faculty that are at the front lines of research, but also are some of the best teachers we have here. And that is one of our passions. Dr. Paul Kilgore, who you might have known or heard from, has been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. His research really looks into communicating with faith-based organizations, non-governmental organizations, and faith others, and his overarching goal is to improve individual patient outcomes, especially in, um, in improving health disparities in underserved populations, which is really one of the goals that we have in our college as well. At least on my thing, I cannot see some graphs, but I wanna talk in the remaining minutes that we have about our vision. Two words when you think about our vision, growth and engagement. And not just growth in terms of number of students, although I'll gladly take that, but growth in our reputation, our spiritual growth, growth in our DEI initiatives, our national and global reputations, our, I, what I really want to see us become is the premier urban healthcare pharmacy settings and also grow in our interprofessional education. I want to increase our engagement. We already have fantastic engagement, but I want to continue to have community facing areas. So what are things that keep me up at night? <laughs> it's, it sounds great, but we do have some challenges and we are rising to those. There is a decreasing amount of students that are interested in pharmacy careers. And this is a national trend. We saw this at the University of Georgia, it's everywhere. How do we go about this and what do we do? Well, I do have some ideas I'm happy to talk about should you be interested in. We need more pathology assistance. I would love to be able to train more, and there's some things that we can do to facilitate that, that I would ask some help. What are some of those initiatives? Well, one of those is out-of-state tuition. The College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences has, at least the College of Pharmacy or the pharmacy side, is not included in the good neighbor policy. That was the decision that was made decades ago, and I agree with that decision at the time, but the landscape has changed. We actually have no out-of-state students in our pathology in our pharmacy program. However, we are doing virtual recruiting right now. And just yesterday, we talked to students who lived in Detroit as a child, whose parents moved away. They're in Pittsburgh, Chicago, Cleveland. They want to move back to Detroit. So we're interviewing them. They want to be in our pharmacy program. But the out-of-state tuition, which is the highest in the state and way above our competitors, is hindering. I'd love to give them an incentive to come back just like I have just done and come back home. So that's some initiative. And the pathology assistant program, which is one of only 12 in the nation, 
students would really love to come here. But so those are some things that I think we can do to help grow our national and global reputation. This is a very long list of questions and discussions. I'm not quite sure why it's on this one, but I'm gonna boil this down and then I'm gonna turn things over to you. One is how to increase um, students interested in our careers, the pipeline. When you talk to many students, they are talking about when they're young, they're thinking about being an MD, a nurse, or a lawyer, and there's nothing. I love those people. Wrong with that, but they're not thinking about radiation technology or maybe nurse anesthesiology or physical therapy, which all serve healthcare. It's, they're not thinking about those early, so they're not as exposed. I want to jump on and give some props to President Wilson, as well as Provost Cornblue, have really initiated diversity and hiring initiatives within the university. And we can do this and take advantage of those within our college to create a more diverse faculty. And that starts with me. And I want to thank them personally for those initiatives. And then, of course, I already talked about competitive out of state tuition rates. I'm happy to talk about these in more detail at any times. And you're more than welcome to get in contact with me at any time. With that, I thank you for your attention and I am more than happy to take any questions. And I'm going to stop sharing. Thank, thank you very much, Dean. That was very informative. Are there questions from the committee? So informative and apparently comprehensive. No <laughs> questions? Great. I just have a comment. Uh, Here we go. I just want to welcome uh, with the note that anybody who's worked on prostate cancer has to be superb. Thank you so much, Governor Kumar. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. One of the. So, uh, this yes, is my uh, first time for forgive me. It's pretty obvious, but I should leave now, right? Thank you. Um, Have a great day. As far as I'm concerned, you can stay for the rest of the committee if you'd like. Uh, I will leave that. I'm sure you have some very important things to discuss, but I'm more than happy, should you need to, to please reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to Provost Cornblue and Mark, with your approval, I'd like to discuss each of items B, C, and D individually but then do one motion for all three since they all relate uh, if we can then we would do item e individually with the motion and then we would do item f individually with a motion does that sound all right and i'll phrase those motions of course if you are agreeable to do b c and d together to include um all three differences yes that sounds great let me okay thanks let me say before we leave um uh, brian's presentation that both dave mazaron and i have been talking about pricing out of state tuition to market to do the best for the university and and i think we we will work with the that college yeah. <laughs> proposals are really sound so uh, i wasn't going to say anything but since you raised it we could talk for a moment on that point I, I think changing the out-of-state tuition levels while we're trying to figure out how we're going to have enough money to run this place is a challenge. So I would urge you to consider seriously as you think through that uh, scholarships or offsets or discounts uh, instead of actual great big changes. But you will know that better than us and you will bring it to us at some point. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. So so next up are three programs in the College of Nursing uh, that we asked to discontinue. I asked uh, Dean Claybo to present these. Lori needs no introduction to the board, but I, I just wanna say she's been an incredible source of help for me in taking on this new role. And I'm very grateful for working with her and I can see how the School of Nursing benefits every day from her leadership. So. Uh, Laurie, can you talk about these midwifery programs? She's here. 
She is here. She may be on mute. I'm sorry, as always. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for those nice comments, Provost Cornblue. Um, these three items really do kind of um, wrap around each other. So there are some commonalities that I'll address. You know, um, as we've talked about over the last number of years, that the advanced practice nursing programs in the College of Nursing are ranked among the best in the country and number two in the state of Michigan. And midwifery has really become um, an outlier to that. It is a relatively small program for us. And we lost a long-term, um, highly respected national leader about six years ago who led that program. And um, over time, the size of the program has um, shrunk. One of the major issues for us is that actually nurse midwifery, um, the market for nurse midwives is um, a little bit um, contracting nationally as compared to the other nurse practitioner opportunities. And um, I think of special import for us is that the perennially ranked number one program in the country is down the street in Ann Arbor. And so we, our program has been relatively small and has had some difficulty attracting um, both quality faculty and students. And there are, it is by far our smallest track. And there are resources, including faculty resources, that could um, move out of this program to help assist our undergraduate students and free up some space in our graduate programs for those programs which are both highly in demand in the city of Detroit and for which we are nationally known. <clears throat> One example of that, for example, is our psych mental health program, where uh, many of you are aware that we were awarded in the MDHHS budget this year um, as the only university in the state to be awarded a single line item of $1.6 million to increase our number of graduates in psych mental health nurse practitioners by 32 over the next four years. So um, this is really a matter of can't do everything, want to really do the things we do exceptionally well. And each of these uh, discontinuances is a variation on an offering in nurse midwifery. So the first is the graduate certificate, which is for um, practitioners who are prepared in another specialty who would like to move or add on nurse midwifery. And we have no students in the GC right now. Um, second is the master's program in nurse midwifery, and that is for nurses who are baccalaureate prepared, who want to seek initial certification as a nurse midwife at the master's level. And the third is the doctorate of nursing practice in nurse midwifery, and that program is for nurses who want um, to move to advanced practice at the doctoral level. And we are recommending that all three of those um, concentrations be discontinued. Thank you. Are there any students currently that we need to help finish their studies? Thank you for that question, Governor Gaffney. Yes, there are currently six students, all of whom will complete by August of 22. So they'll finish spring summer semester of August of 22. And that's why we ask for these discontinuances effective fall. There you go. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? No, I'm not on the committee, but I have okay. a question. Please, please. Um, thank you, Dean Claybo. We talked about this uh, a little while ago. Um, just to follow up on your presentation, um, it, it, I know that this is a challenging um, area to attract faculty to. Is this an area that there's a lot of student interest from or in? So real, thanks again for the question, Governor Thompson. Um, it, you're right, it is difficult. You, you know about the national nursing faculty shortage and it's more acute in midwifery. But it, we have attracted a smaller and smaller population of students 
over the past six years. So I, um, we've been a moratorium now for a year, but prior to that, we saw declining interest. And um, this is one of the very few programs where we don't have far more applicants than we have available seats. Okay. And is that the case just for our program? Do you happen to know um, if that's the case for other midwifery programs in Michigan? It's certainly not the case for the University of Michigan, which is, again, the number one ranked program in the country. But otherwise, across the country, we are seeing some waxing and waning in interest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Anyone else? Then I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the discontinuance of nurse midwife graduate certificate program and the discontinuance of the nurse midwife specialty in the doctor of nursing program and the discontinuance of nurse midwife specialty in masters of science program. So one motion, all three discontinuances. May I have a motion? So move. And a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any other questions or comments? You know, I don't, I don't know how, uh, Dean, if I can comment, Chairman. Yes, uh, please. I don't know how, how Dean Schweitzer or President Wilson or Dr. Kumar feel, but um, I'm a huge supporter of ancillary personnel and health care. But I, I have personal knowledge over the past five years of, of over more than one case where people have chosen to deliver with a midwife outside of a hospital setting where the babies have died because they needed a C-section emergently and no one was available to do it. And I just have really been mixed about this specialty. Um, and it's maybe it's just my personal experience that has soured me on this. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't agree with uh, Dean Claybo more that we probably better use those resources moving them into nursing where we have a drastic shortage. And I've experienced over the past couple of weeks, many cancellations of elective surgery because they don't have nurses. And I, I think we could deploy those services better elsewhere. Um, I'd like to know if anyone else has any comments, but that's been my experience. Thank you, no, I, Michael. I agree with you, Michael. Um, the only thing is that uh, trends keep changing. Uh, for example, Beaumont Hospital right now is actively uh, recruiting nurse uh, midwives, and uh, some of the other hospitals want to try to do the same thing. But I think uh, it is uh, it is rightly thought uh, 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 Clemo, that uh, uh, we don't need to invest our resources. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions? Okay. Uh, it's been the motion was made and seconded. All in favor of the three program discontinuances, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? All right. The motion passes. Provost Cornblue, we're coming back to you now to discuss another uh, discontinuance, Bachelor of Science in Education. Yes. Yeah, so, so I've asked Associate Provost Darren Ellis to present this. Uh, as you know, he, he is in charge of our accreditation and the registrar's office reports to him. So um, this is an area he oversees. With him to answer any questions is Paul Johnson, the Associate Dean of the College of Engineering. Um, Darren? Uh, hi, thanks everyone. It's uh, good to be with you here today. Um, so before you is a uh, recommendation to discontinue the Bachelor of Science in Education in Learning, Design, and Technology. Um, this is uh, a major that was uh, basically over the last five years has had very low enrollment. And um, there are only about seven institutions nationwide that even offer this. It's, it's typically a graduate degree and uh, essentially as part of a package of um, proposals uh, to, to streamline the offerings of the College of Education. Uh, we have uh, 
uh, this first one, and we'll, we'll be getting more in future uh, future meetings. So um, there's a plan to take care of the three remaining students in the program, and um, we expect them to be done by the end of winter 22. So that's why we have the uh, decision effective that day. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments? I have just one comment. Uh, frequently, when we're asked to discontinue a program, we hear from the administrator in charge that the program has few students. And it has occurred to me that perhaps the administrators there have, uh, have, dis have, have discouraged enrollments in those areas prior to coming to us to ask for a discontinuance. Um, and it strikes me as perhaps that might not be the best way for things to proceed, if that's the case. <laughs> which not, which, which comes first? Really, which comes first, yeah, the so, chicken or the egg? So um, I, I think, uh, so annually at least, we, we do present a low enrollment report to the Board of Governors. And I would be happy to go over that um in in more detail it, it should the should the go the the board um like that so i do you recall offhand the last time you re, you uh showed us that shared that report with us um i i do not i'd have to consult with uh my colleague julie on that it, i don't remember julie do you it, it has been a while but we, we talked about this in a recent review meeting that it it might be something to bring back, but it has been a while before, since that's come. Well, based on Governor Kelly's question and 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 uh, uh, the answer, let's tee it up. Uh, Mr. Provost, you think we can do that next meeting? Uh, sure, we can do that. I, I would okay. just say that I would just say that this is not a selective admissions major, so there sort of is no way to discourage the students. You know, students would declare this major. So at the undergraduate level, it's not really there's not really a case of us discouraging. Um, and, and I think that the in the previous majors, the School of Nursing, um, there was not an active in any way efforts to to discourage that as well. They were you know. Except one might say if we didn't have the, you know, we lost the world class staff that was running it. And so students were, look, you know, student applications reflected the staff that we had available. But, you know, it wasn't the, our desire to discourage students in any way. So I have, yeah. I have a question uh, other than uh, Darren, other than the fact that this is normally a graduate program. What are the reasons that a Bachelor of Science is no longer attractive to students or, you know, why aren't they enrolling? Just general. Uh, I, I I will uh, I'll I'll attempt an answer real quick, okay. um, but I'll also <laughs> invite my colleague uh, Paul Johnson to to jump in. Um, okay. So this is specifically the Bachelor of Science in Education with a major in Learning Design and Technology. Okay. Um, okay. So other other majors in the College of Education are doing fine, and in fact, um, that you know they're they're retooling and uh, continually revamping the curriculum to keep up with state requirements and stuff. So um, specifically, though, with learning design and technology, it tends to be either a minor or a graduate degree, and they are keeping the minor at the undergraduate level. So we will have the offerings for undergraduates. They just won't require the, the level of resources that a, a very low enrollment bachelor's program would. OK, so Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I will say that a year before we requested a moratorium on this uh, um, major, we did a, a year long campaign of trying to recruit and trying to sustain the major. Um, to give you an indication of, of the efforts, we sent out 1800 um, messages to prospective candidates um, with a very well um, enhanced messaging with videos and, um, and links. And that resulted in only two prospects coming forward. So before we, we took this undertaking to discontinue it, we made efforts to try to boost enrollment um, before ultimately making this decision. In the long history of the College of Ed, over 140 years, this is a, a very a young program. It's it's nine years old. This okay. is its second moratorium, and okay. um, we're coming to the board to discontinue so that we can strengthen our graduate programs. And to Governor Staccato, um, the 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 career outlook 
is much stronger at the graduate level than it is uh, for mm -hmm. undergraduates. I agree. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Appreciate it. OK, uh, and I, I see in the um, <laughs> materials before us that there the learning design and technology program faculty uh, has approved the discontinuance. Is there any comment from the faculty representative on the committee this morning? No. OK. All right, um, any other questions, comments on this discontinuance? Then let me ask for a motion, please, uh, for the board to approve the discontinuance of the Bachelor of Science in Education in Learning, Design, and Technology. So moved. Did you get it, Julie? I got it. And a second, please. Uh, Governor Brazuito, second. Good, yeah. great. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Last chance for discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Thank you very much. Dean Cornblue, you're still on the hot seat, <laughs> this time for a revision in the statute uh, in university requirements for a baccalaureate degree. Yeah, so this is a proposal that relates to dual degrees. Um, this is uh, basically grows out of faculty response to student requests. Um, um, it's an effort that has been led by our faculty. Um, this proposal has been, it was uh, uh, endorsed by the policy committee and approved by the academic senate. And um, since there are a lot of details here, I again am asked uh, Associate Provost Darren Ellis to present it to you. With him to answer any questions is uh, Heather Dilloway, who's Associate Dean in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And I owe a debt of thanks to uh, Professor Dilloway, who spent a lot of effort in trying to make dual degrees more, more useful for our students. So, yeah. Darren? Yeah, I just I first want to start by echoing uh, Provost Crumbler's uh, thanks of, of Dean Dilloway. I think it's really uh, her leadership that's brought this forward. Um, so essentially what we have here is a proposal to even the playing field for uh, our students who want to get a, um, a, dual, a double major versus those that are in a more specialized degree. So um, I think everybody's probably familiar with the concept um, of needing 120 credits to graduate and that um, if you're clever and there's space, you can easily get a double major inside of that. But the, the trouble is, is the way the policy uh, sits right now you can only do that if it if the double major sits on the same degree so um you know that means like if you want a bs in physics and a ba in um you know history or whatever we're not we don't have a way to do that right now within policy um we've had a growth of specialized degrees over the last um 10 years or so so now we have specialized degrees like the bachelor of public health um, and those students currently can't get, uh, they, they, in order to get a second credential, they would have to stay for 150 credits. So essentially this proposal allows our students like those in the Bachelor of Public Health program to, to get a second credential, a second degree within 120 credits if they're able to. Um, now they, you know, due, due to major requirements and things like that, it won't always fit within 120, but, um, but it would be allowed if it could. So uh, that's that's essentially the proposal, um, and we can certainly take any questions. Questions or comments? So let me add that this especially serves our best students with an increase in AP credits and an increase in dual enrollments at the high school. We have more students who are coming here with college credits at the time they start, so um, that so they can fit within their you know, 120 or 130 degrees the the requirements for two majors, and um, so we think this is important. and the, And the student student council really urged us to do this as well. So, is there a financial impact here? In other words, someone probably looked at the number of students doing the signing up for and paying for the extra credits as required. Since we're considering discontinuing this, 
I'm going to assume that was kind of a low number. But at any rate, if you multiply that low number by the um, uh, tuition costs, you come up with some income. Your assumption, of course, is that this will encourage students to take double majors. But if I'm understanding it right, it won't add to additional income because they won't be taking more classes or so, will they? So it may. Um, for so like uh, while it would be possible under policy to get uh, the double degree within 120 uh, credits, it is quite often the case that um, the specialized degrees have long prereq strings and um, more credits required. So um, we could be encouraging students to stay for 130 or 135 credits to get the two degrees when when they just wouldn't be able to at all for anything short of 150, which is essentially 30 more credits. You're, you're talking a master's degree at that point. So um, 150 is a tough number to sell for the second degree. 130, 135, maybe not so much. There you go. I, I so think... you, you'll you track this and maybe at some point it may take a year or more. Um, you'll let us know how it's coming out. Yes. Yeah, I think we're good. We're really excited to see the, yeah. the uptake on this. And, yeah. um, and just for the first part of your question, it, it, indeed, the number of dual degree students is in the low handful, uh, single digits every year. Yeah. Yeah. So let me add it. It's also a question of basic fairness. So, you know, someone could get a, a double major, two degrees in a Bachelor of Science in, in biology and one in chemistry now for 120 degree credits. So now this will allow a student to get do the same if they're getting a Bachelor of Public Health and a Bachelor of Biology. So it, it's really a fairness issue with the growth of more of different types of undergraduate degrees that we have. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Governor Gaffney, I believe uh, Professor Roth had a question. Yes, please. Yes, I, I just wanted to say that the Academic Senate strongly supports this initiative, and I, I particularly want to commend Associate Dean Delaway, uh, who on, on this, as on many other issues, has really performed uh, remarkable work, uh, and uh, so very much want to recognize that. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean, and thank you, Professor, for weighing in on that. We um, always look to see and want to make sure that the faculty has reviewed these changes. That gives us full confidence at the board level. So we appreciate that. I'll add that we went to specific undergraduate serving colleges first and got faculty on board um, in, in social work, business, education, engineering, CFPCA, and class before we even brought it to Senate because we knew how important that was. And we have the students' uh, support here as well, it's been stated. So, okay, any other comments, questions? All right, uh, so we will need a motion to actually revise the statute on university requirements for the baccalaureate degree, section 2.43.11.120. And uh, you've heard what it will do. It will reduce the requirements for a double degree. And uh, we're confident like um, associate provost is that we could end up in a better position and it's certainly more fair and um, appreciated by the students. Can I have a motion then to revise that section? So moved. And a second? Support. Support. Any last comments, questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, let me ask um, the finance vice president. Did you hear me ask the question about income for you there, David? I really appreciate it, Governor. Okay, Gaffney. well, we'll keep thinking that way. And Chairman Barnhill reminds me I have to keep thinking that way. So, all right, um, last item should be very interesting. Uh, 
Provost Kornblu, are you going to introduce the curator of our art collection? Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Grace Seurat. Grace is curator of the University Art Collection. She earned her BFA from Wayne State and her MFA in Fine Arts and Painting from Dominican University in Florence, Italy. She's an artist herself and has the background in art and, and medicine. And she's gonna give us an overview of our art collection. Um, I, I've been thrilled to learn more about the quality of our art collection. So, Grace. Lovely, thank you for the introduction, um, Provost Cornblue, and thank you, President Wilson and Board of Governors for having me. I'm going to share my screen so you can see. So I, I have been the collection curator for about four and a half years, and I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to tell you about this really exciting and important art collection. The University Art Collection began in 1968 with 126 pieces and has grown to be 6,700 pieces over the past 50 years, all through donations. The value of this collection probably exceeds $10 million. We're really not sure, but this Tiffany window on the top slide that's in the Beecher House was recently appraised for about a million dollars itself. The Walter Gropius mural that's in the student center below that is a WPA mural that was created in 1941 and of course is priceless. But the goal for our collection is to connect to and to represent our community. So many of the works of art that are in the collection are displayed around campus. What we are most noted for is Detroit and regional art. With, we have a great interest not only in Detroit and regional art, but those that are, are connected to the university, either alum or faculty. Uh, there's no other collection like ours. I know people say that all the time, but this is a collection that really reflects the cultural legacy of the city of Detroit. And thanks to the great philanthropist James Pearson Duffy, who our art school is named after, we also are known for having the most comprehensive Detroit Cast Corridor collection in the world. So the Detroit Cast Corridor art movement is considered Detroit's first avant-garde art movement, which flourished in the 1960s and 70s, either on or near uh, Wayne State's campus. And many of the artists were either faculty or artists. Uh, faculty or students and there's a really distinct unrefined urban aesthetics that is the legacy of Detroit Cast Corridor Arts. You may have seen some of this work around campus um, but many of these artists are, are uh, known nationally, have gone on to have big national careers and have works in museums you know all over the country. But something that's really unique is, and important is that we're poised to be the center for research on Cass Corridor art. Because of Jim Duffy, we have a collection of over 40 years worth of letters and photographs and journals and sketchbooks that are all inventoried in catalogs and will provide a wealth of information for scholarly research. So we, we have this really amazing collection. But that's not all we are. We're not just Cass Corridor. Our collection of African-American art is growing and it includes some of the most recognized contemporary artists. Huey Lee Smith, MacArthur, MacArthur Binion, Peter Williams, Carol Harris. Most who are faculty or alumni at, at the university who've touched this community. But you know, access to this collection is really our primary goal and to meet the goal of connecting with the entire community. We've developed a really deep relationship with the university libraries. We put art in all of the libraries because all students go to the library and it's a way for us to bring this collection to them and to their lives. A new installation at the Purdy Library is designed to reflect the diversity of, of our campus and to create a feeling of inclusion. And we know that belonging is the key factor to student retention. So filling the library with imagery that reflects our students is really important. We also um, were able to, to add to our collection because when you collect uh, art built through gifts, oftentimes it doesn't reflect the entire community. So with the support of the Knight Foundation, we received a grant in 2019 and were able to commission the work of a world-renowned Arab-American photographer, 
Farah Al Qasimi to create a series of photographs representing Detroit's Arab American community. And through our partnership with the Arab American National Museum, we were able to extend that reach of the grant and connect with that community through lectures and, and workshops at the museum itself. A National Endowment for the Arts grant the same year provided us the opportunity to work with one of our most famous alums, uh, Shiva uh, Ahmadi, who is an Iranian American. It allowed us to commission work and to have an exhibition and a lecture series. And the two uh, works of art on the left of the screen are works that we were able to commission through this grant. One very important priority that I have is to integrate this collection into the academic curriculum of all curriculums. We're currently using this collection to train medical students to develop keen observation skills through visual thinking strategies. Medical students learn to read ultrasounds as a way, as a way to facilitate clinical diagnoses. Interpretation of these images is challenging for them. So we're helping solve those challenges by teaching them to look and discuss artwork as a way to begin to translate visual thinking skills and critical thinking skills into reading ultrasounds. In this same research study, we were able to, to work with both art therapy and medical students to have them develop their awareness of implicit biases when they're diagnosing and assessing patients. We have received national recognition for these very small efforts. The Association of American Medical Colleges has provided us a grant to support research using visual thinking strategies to train medical students. We're featured on November's cover of the AAMC newsletter, and um, our students who participated in this have presented at both an international and national conference. We also use this collection to train future museum workers. We are working with art, art history, and arts administration students to teach them about collections management and care. And we're working with museum professionals. So this is a class that we're offering in our collection. Doug Boca from the Detroit Institute of Arts. He's working with students on campus, but he's also taking them to the museum. So not only does it provide them with firsthand experience, of working with collections, but it also assists us in moving our collection care program forward. It didn't stop us during COVID. We offered a virtual class where we were training our students how to be curators to do online um, exhibitions and educational activities like museums do all over the world. They use this collection to create exhibitions that have been featured in Art Detroit now. So these uh, exhibitions that they've curated are included in all the exhibitions that are in regional galleries. As always, our location is one of the greatest strengths we have because we're uniquely positioned to connect with the broader community because of our accessibility. We have a, a campus sculpture walk and, and the art walk guide is online or you can get it in the libraries. We have self-guided tours for art in the, the Adamani and art in the Purdy Library. And we also have a, um, our online collection that you can find at artmuseum.wayne.edu. So the university is charged with the responsibility to protect and preserve these precious gifts and we follow museum standards for caring for this work uh, with very limited resources. But this collection preserves and protects Detroit's cultural heritage and it reflects the important role that Wayne State University has played in shaping this artistic community. So I have put in your package and invite you for a personal tour whenever you can contact me i'm going to stop sharing my screen now and if you have any questions i'd be happy to answer any of them thank you very much that was very interesting <laughs> questions or comments grace um would you mind um just mentioning a few words about um what happened during the flood and uh, if there were anything that was damaged and, um, and and maybe just a few words about our our storage. 
So we have storage in the basement of Old Main. It's called a sub-basement, which is not uncommon. Museums have storage in lower levels as well because they have exhibition spaces. So our collection storage area did receive a lot of water. We didn't lose any artwork in this collection storage area, but all of the work had to be removed out of this area. Walls were torn out. We spent two months just dealing with the flood in this area alone. We have some very large scale pieces from the, the, the Duffy collection that were in storage in the art building in Shavers. And unfortunately that did get wet. So there were three feet of water in the uh, storage room that we had these crated sculptures. So we are bursting at the seam uh, in terms of storage space. There's, it's very, very challenging for us. The idea too is that if we had um, an exhibition space that the works that were in storage that were damaged would not have been damaged because they would be in the public realm. Not everything is appropriate for libraries, so we are not able to install them there. Or maybe they're too large or maybe they're, they're too vulnerable to be in those kind of environments. So it was very challenging for us and it, it has really revealed the, 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 uh, the need for more storage space because many of these gifts are still coming our way. And I hate for the university to turn gifts down because if we are the Center for Research for Detroit Art, we need this work here. It's not just having one representation of a painting by a particular artist. It's really having the ability to research and see the evolution of their career. So space is a, a, a very big concern for us and also caring for the work and the manner in which we're obligated to care for it becomes an issue when you don't have enough space. And our space is necessary to have climate control. Not only, you know, we were prepared in Old Main that things were high enough that we didn't get damage from, from uh, the flood, although the room did get damaged. But that might not happen in the future if we don't have more room. I'd like to add a word. Uh, board members may remember that several years ago we approved, expanded, uh, actually an exhibition space, um, and it never reached fruition. It never happened. If had if it had happened, perhaps some of this loss might not have taken place. Um, but I think it reminds us of the importance of not letting this this goal that we've approved fall away. I think in the board in the future the board should should pursue uh, a specific exhibition space for our art. And I thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Any other comments or questions? Julie, would you be kind enough to, uh, on, on, on one of your <laughs> numerous emails, ask the board if they'd uh, like to take Ms. Sarah up on her kind invitation for a tour? And that way, maybe we can prevent her from having to do up to eight tours, but we, we may be able to come together as a smaller uh, group. So thank you for that invitation. I think some of us, or maybe all of us, will take you up on that. I would love Any, to do that. Anything else on this issue, President Wilson? I think Governor Barnhill had a hand. Oh, hand. thank you. Yeah. Uh, Governor just Barnhill. See whether the damaged pieces insured and can you elaborate um, more on the types of relationships we might have with galleries and museums and uh, the community? Sure, I'll, I'll start with the first one. The works that were damaged were insured and we were able to restore them. So we didn't lose anything, but there was a tremendous amount of cost that's associated with that type of restoration as well as the, the building itself. So they were insured. We insure works for uh, anything that is $10,000 and above because of the deductible. So all of the large pieces that were in storage that were touched by this flood were insured. Um, in terms of, of exhibition space, the University uh, uh, um, Art Department has two galleries, the Art Department Gallery and the Elaine Jacobs Gallery. We're, we partner with them, but they have their own mission and their own exhibition seasons uh, planned with an exhibition committee. So we're not able to exhibit this work on a regular basis in those galleries. We do partner with 
uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts, Barbara Heller has been extremely uh, helpful to us during the flood. She was on my speed dial. She was here assessing the work and helping us every step of the way. She texted me on Tuesday, I'm giving Tuesday about giving towards collection care to the university. So I think that the awareness of what this collection is and our interest in caring for it is really important to that community. We have a faculty member from the museum who said he offered to come and work with our students when he saw our, our interest in caring for this work. Did I answer your entire question? Uh, yes, and I mean, just the last one was what sort of programming do we have uh, for the community uh, well, to get folks engaged in art research? So the the I think that the issue of the gallery space opens greater opportunities for programming. We do our very best, but when you come and visit our storage area, you'll see that it's very congested. We can work with small groups of students, but we really can't do programming in this environment. When we partner with uh, the galleries or we partner with community galleries, we can bring our artwork into a public realm and do programming. But it's without a gallery, it's really hard to um, develop ongoing programming and, and ways of, of utilizing this collection with community without a space. Any other, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, that, again, uh, Curator Sarah, thank you very much for preparing all this and coming and sharing it with us. I think that's it. Uh, Provost Cornblue, anything else from your end? Uh, I'll just say that we're working on an update of both fall enrollment numbers and where we stand for winter and fall for next year that we will send to the board in writing uh, next week. We we have some, you know, right now we're, we're looking better for both January and last fall than we were uh, this fall. So we'd like to share good news for uh, this time. So we'll send you some numbers shortly. Thank you very much. We, we like to hear good news yes. and i appreciate you remembering i'd asked about that thank you um with if there is no other in uh information or questions comments come before us um uh i'll i don't remember if we actually take a motion to adjourn or not but i'll take a motion no. to adjourn no you don't have to take a motion to adjourn. all right then yeah i'll do uh, it by myself do. i adjourn oh. this meeting thank right. you very much um before we uh, adjourn for good, I, I just wanted to uh, and Grace and just uh, let everybody know, I mean, we are so fortunate to have her. I mean, she is so knowledgeable and so passionate and our arts and really great hands uh, uh, with her. Um, the board's going to be in recess and we'll reconvene for the public uh, meeting at 3.30. Uh, I'd like to ask all the board members if they could hop on uh, 